All right, so welcome to video number five. This one's going to be all about how blocks are serialized and an introduction to Bitcoin's scripting language, what it's for and what it looks like under the hood. So let me start by saying that when I say serialized block, I'm basically talking about the format in which the block is sent over the network. So the serialization of a block is part of the consensus rules. And you can imagine why that would be, because we don't want to accept any blocks that have weird and wonderful data in them. It's very important that we stick to a strict set of rules when it comes to block serialization. You can see here that a block won't be accepted unless its serialized size is with, within one megabyte in size. And there are three fields which contribute to the serialized size of a block. There's 80 bytes for the block header. And we know that the block header is always going to be 80 bytes because the format that the block header is made up with is also part of the consensus rules. The other two fields, however, have a variable length. There's the transaction count and then the actual raw transactions themselves. See, we don't know ahead of time how many transactions are going to be in the block. So we can't just allocate a fixed number of bytes for the transaction count because we might exceed the max value able to be stored in those bytes. And the same goes for the transactions themselves. We might need more or less space depending on the block. So let's recall from last time that the first transaction in the block is always the Coinbase transaction. And you can see here that it says that this Coinbase transaction is responsible for collecting and spending any transaction fees paid by transactions which are in this block. So really you can see the Coinbase transaction is actually kind of a cleanup of all these fees in the block. And then of course the Coinbase transaction also includes the block reward. So we can have a clean way of giving a block reward to the miner while spending the transaction fees. So that's pretty neat. Then it says that all blocks before block 6,930,000 are entitled to something called the block subsidy. Now I'm not really sure why they called it the block subsidy. What it actually means is the mining reward. The mining reward started at 50 bitcoins when it began, but now it's 12.5 bitcoins because as part of the Bitcoin protocol, it gets halved once every four years or so. So transaction outputs use something called pubkey scripts to set up the conditions by which the coins themselves are allowed to be spent. It can be pretty much broken down to who is allowed to spend them. And actually pubkey scripts are just designed as a way to push data onto the stack and check it. They don't provide the same functionality as, say, Ethereum smart contracts, which provide a Turing complete programming language, which is able to do a whole bunch of interesting extra stuff on top of the blockchain. Bitcoin scripts are purposefully designed to be something called non-Turing complete, which basically means there are restrictions on the language, and there are just certain things that it's not possible to do with the Bitcoin scripting language. This is done for security. No one can use the Bitcoin scripting language to make elaborate transactions that would effectively pwn the network. Bitcoin scripts use something called opcodes. And if you've ever programmed in assembly languages, you'll know what these are. But if not, you can think of them as a super memory efficient programming language, which is pretty much as close as you can get to the hardware while still having a language that's somewhat humanly readable. The opcodes are used to push signatures and public keys onto the stack. That is how they're verified. And we can transact currency on the Bitcoin network. Here is a list of the Bitcoin opcodes. You can see that there are a huge amount of them. And you could spend a lot of time figuring out how they all work. But just think of it as the language which verifies public keys and signatures to provide secure transactions on the network. So let's have a quick look at some of these opcodes. If you get confused as to what they do, chances are you're trying to overcomplicate it because you can think of these opcodes as performing one super basic operation. So let's start with a really simple one. And that is called optrue. Optrue, sometimes called op1, simply pushes the value one onto the stack. That's all it does. It takes the value one and goes, cool, push that onto the stack. The developers out there might remember that in many programming languages, the value true can be equally represented as the value one. They often evaluate the same thing. So op true and op one in Bitcoin's scripting language actually mean the same thing. So following on from that, we have op2, which you might have guessed that op2 just pushes the value of 2 onto the stack. Well, yep, that's exactly what it does. And in fact, op3 all the way up to op16 do the same thing. They simply push their respective number onto the stack. So you can think of these as hard-coded integers that we can use in the scripting language. 
Now you may be wondering what the OX52 to OX60 part means here. Well, these opcodes actually have a corresponding hexadecimal value that the opcodes are converted into on their way to becoming a language that the computer can actually execute. So each opcode has its corresponding hexadecimal value. You also might be wondering, why does it stop on OP16? Why not OP17 or OP18? Well, remember how we do 256, char 256 encryption? Well, actually, 256 is a multiple of 16. So 16 is sort of the highest important number that we have to worry about. So that's why it stops at 16. In fact, you'll see that numbers which are a multiple of 16 are a common occurrence in the Bitcoin protocol. Hexadecimal, for example, is a base 16 numbering system. The next one on the list here is op check sig. It's the op code for checking key signatures. A key signature is a way that we can verify that someone has the private key corresponding to a public key without having to show anyone the private key and potentially compromise it. We use op check sig for this verification. You can see here that op check sig consumes the signature and public key. Then the output of this operation, whether true or false, is pushed onto the stack. It's true when the signature indeed corresponds to the public key it is put with, but false if the validation didn't work. Then there's opdupe. That pretty much just looks at what's on top of the stack and puts a copy of it on top of the stack again. Now the ophash160 is a cryptographic opcode. It takes the SHA-256 hash of the item on top of the stack and then applies another cryptographical hash onto it called RIPEMD160. Now, I'm not sure if people pronounce this hashing algorithm as RIPEMD, but from now on I'm just going to call it RIPEMD160 whenever it pops up again, and you'll know what I mean. Next, there's op equal, which checks whether the two topmost items on the stack are equal and pushes true on top of the stack if they are, and of course false if they aren't. Then there's op verify. That is used to kill the script if something goes wrong. You can look at it like the assert function in C++. If the data passed into op verify is false, then it just terminates the script and doesn't look back. Op equal verify is just the same as if you use op equal and the op verify opcodes in that order. You can think of it as the two opcodes smushed together into one opcode. And the final one here on this list is op check multi-sig. So what this opcode does is it looks at the value on top of the stack. Let's pretend that it found the number six then it would consume six of the next items on top of the stack and assume they're all public keys. So now we have a new value on top of the stack and it consumes um, m of the next items on the stack, treating them as signatures plus one extra value. We're comparing signatures against public keys here and looking for the ECDSA match. ECDSA, also known as elliptic curve encryption, is just another of the many encryption protocols used by Bitcoin. Note that the signatures have to be placed in the correct order that corresponds to the public keys because they're checked in pairs and not checked again if they result in a failure. So I'm going to link to a list of all the opcodes used in the Bitcoin scripting language in the video description, but there's seriously so many and most of them you really don't need to worry about when you're starting out as a Bitcoin application or altcoin developer. The main thing I'd like you to get out of this video is that the Bitcoin scripting language is a super bare bones and memory efficient scripting language designed for a specific purpose, and that is being the gatekeeper for spending coins. And actually, I think I might leave the video there for now because it's starting to get kind of long. Make sure you like this video to encourage me to do more and leave all of your questions in the comments, no matter how stupid or complicated they are, and I will make sure I answer as many as I can. And finally, make sure you subscribe to my channel so that I can teach you everything you need to know about Bitcoin and altcoin developing.